None of his friends saw Nazism as we, you and I, saw it in any respect. Most of us see Nazism as a form of tyranny. Meyer's friends did not know before 1933 that Nazism was evil. They did not know between 1933 and 1945 that it was evil, and they do not now know it now. After the war, they look back on the Nazi period as the best time of their lives. His suggestion is that even when tyrannical governments do horrific things and are, you know, a beautiful legacy of the United States includes horrific things, early, midstream, yesterday, even when tyrannical governments, which ours emphatically isn't, do terrific things, outsiders exaggerate one thing. The effect of those things on the actual lives on, on most citizens who focus on their own families and friends and the sites which meet them in their daily rounds. Nazis have made things better for Meyer's friends, not because it restored some lost national pride, that's a myth, but because it improved daily life. Germans had jobs and better housing. They could vacation in Norway and Spain. Sick people were more likely to receive treatment. Fewer people were hungry or cold. The blessings of the new order, as it was called, seemed to be enjoyed by everybody. Now there's an irony in that word, but it was sincere. Even in retrospect, Meyer's subject liked and admired Hitler. They saw him as someone who, quote, had a feeling for the masses of people and spoke in direct opposition to the existing order. They applauded Hitler for his rejection of the whole pack and for his cleanup. The bank clerk described Hitler as a spellbinder, a natural warrior. He was carried away from truth, even from truth, by his passion. Even so, he always believed what he said. Meyer did not bring up the topic of anti-Semitism with any of his subjects. But after they became friends, every single one of them did, and they returned to it frequently. When the local synagogue was burned in 18, 1938, most of the community was under only one obligation. Can you guess what it was? Not to interfere. That was their obligation. Meyer showed his subjects a local newspaper from 1938, which had this report. In the interest of their own security, a number of male Jews were taken into custody yesterday. This morning, they were sent away from the city. Not one of them remembered seeing that, or anything like that. The killing of six million Jews? Fake news. Four of Mayer's subjects insisted the only Jews taken to concentration camps were traitors, four of the ten. The rest were permitted to leave, they believed, with their property or its fair market value. The bill collector agreed that the killing of Jews, quote, was wrong unless they committed treason in wartime, and of course they did. He added, some say it happened and some say it didn't. You can show me pictures of skulls, but that doesn't prove it. In any case, Hitler himself had nothing to do with it. The tailor, a smart, good man, spoke similarly. If it happened, it was wrong, he said but I don't believe it happened. With evident fatigue, the baker reported, one had no time to think. There was so much going on. That account was similar to that of one of Mayer's colleagues, someone who had been in Germany at the time, who emphasized the incremental nature of the descent into tyranny and said that we had no time to think about these dreadful things that were growing little by little all around us. He emphasized the gradual habituation of the people to being governed by surprise. In his account, each step was so small, so inconsequential, so well explained, or on occasion so regretted, 
that the Germans could no more see it, quote, developing from day to day than a farmer in his field sees the corn growing. One day it is over his head. Now, if some of you are getting chills down your spine at like that, good. <coughs> Focusing largely on 1933, Hafner, and I have to say, I fell in love with both of these authors. They're so different. Hafner, in his 20s, um, um, stunned to see what's happening to his country at the time. Meyer, much older, going back to see what the, the land of his ancestors had done and meeting people he really liked. Half of his pictures is different, though. He says the true nature of Nazism was evident to him from the start. Studying law with the goal of becoming a judge, he describes the effects of Nazism on the lives of his high-spirited friends and students who were preoccupied with three things, fun, job prospects, and love affairs. As soon as the Nazis took power, he half he says with less pride than just um, surprise, I think. He says he was personally saved, and it's almost as if his soul was saved, by his capacity to smell the rot. As for the Nazis, he writes, my nose left me with no doubt. It was just tiresome to talk about which of their goals and intentions was acceptable and historically justified when all of it stank how it stank, that the Nazis were enemies, my enemies, and the enemies of all I held dear, was crystal clear to me from the outset. This is someone writing at 25, never published the manuscript, became a distinguished journalist of some fame, his own personal account of Germany at the time, invisible until his son found it in the basement. As Hafner describes it, citizens were distracted by celebrations and festivities. There was intimidation, but still, people flirted, enjoyed to the romances, went to the cinema, and went dancing together. Sounding here just like Mayer, the American, speaking of his friends, Hafner writes that it was the automatic continuation of ordinary life that hindered any lively, forceful reaction against the horror. So here he's vindicating his claim, it's not the generals and the ministers, or Hitler, it's the hindered reaction against the horror. Hindered people experiencing their lives. In Hafner's telling, the collapse of freedom and the rule of law occurred in increments, some of which seemed small and insignificant. When Nazi officers stood outside Jewish shops, Jews were just, quote, offended, not worried, not anxious. Just offended. But Hafner insists that Hitler's brutality and the ongoing politicization of everyday life was clear early on. In the first year of Hitler's regime, a self styled Republican, where the word Republican means someone who's committed to democratic self government, told Hafner avoid any skeptical comments, they'd be of no use. And then his friend said, quote, I think I know the fascists better than you. We Republicans must howl with the wolves. And I think it's a fortunate feature in our language that Republicans, and I say I was a, this as a Massachusetts Republican for a long time, who was so committed to nonpartisanship that I just registered to vote in Concord for the first time, not a party member. But Republicans, people of my longstanding party, they are howling with the wolves. Hafner catalogs much worse howling. Books started to disappear from bookshops and libraries. Journals and newspapers disappeared too. Even in 1933, Germans who refused to support Nazism found themselves subject to daily insults and humiliations. But Hafner had a private refuge. A small group of young people studying law who formed something like an intimate debating club. A bunch of friends. They loved each other. One of the members named Holtz held nationalistic views. 
He was pro Hitler. Others disagreed. But for a long time, it was really civil, the kind of energetic discussions people have when they talk about politics. Here's when the group fell apart. Holtz accused Hafner of, quote, ignoring the monumental developments in the resurgence of the German people. And he accused him of being, quote, a latent danger to the state, unquote, and threatened to denounce him to the Gestapo. Not far from its end, as the group of friends breaks up, Hafner's narrative provides a delicate, and I think unbearably moving, account of several idyllic weeks with the love of his life, who was engaged to an Englishman and about to leave Germany for good. And you can see as he writes the narrative, if he had a love of his life after the age of 25 that equaled this one, it would be lucky and surprising. This was a great love affair. She, seeing his distress after informing him of her engagement, responded with infinite gentleness. For now, I'm still here. Summarizing those weeks and something about human resilience, Hafner's unfinished manuscript, he never completed it, ends with some words from the German poet Friedrich Holderlin, let us not look forward nor back, be cradled as in a swaying boat on the sea. For those who seek the German experience in the 20th century, Mayer and Hafner are the place to look. For those who were concerned about the rise of authoritarianism, or challenges to democratic norms in any one of a number of nations, Mayer and Hafner are illuminating because of the fine-grained, intimate nature of their accounts. Of course, we can't be sure whether to believe Mayer's friends when they claim ignorance of what Hitler actually did. Mayer isn't sure either, but they're convincing mayor's friends when they say that at the time they were mostly focused on their families, their friends, and their everyday lives. Hafner's depiction of the automatic continuation of ordinary life, possible for almost everyone amidst their government step-by-step -step assault on dignity and freedom, it's in exactly the same vein. So what you know, shocked me was the American going back in the 50s and the contemporaneous German, they have the same tale. These lessons should not be lost on contemporary readers. <laughs> Turkey has been sliding toward authoritarianism through tactics not like, unlike those of the Nazis, jailing political dissidents, attacking freedom of speech, treating critics as enemies of the state, and obliterating checks and balances. Compared to Germany or Turkey, President Trump has been far more bark than bite, but some of the barks have a history that's both ugly and revealing. The Nazis applied the term Lugenpresse, lying press, to the mainstream media. President Trump refers to the fake news media, which he says is the enemy of the American people. In significant domains, including climate change, his administration denigrate, denigrates science. It's only recently that he's even filled the position, the very important position, of the White House science advisor. The Nazis also dismissed or politicized science in favor of what they claimed to be the spirit of the Volk. If the President of the United States is frequently lying, complaining that the independent press is responsible for fake news, calling for withdrawal of licenses from television networks, publicly demanding jail sentences for public political opponents, undermining the authority of the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, magnifying social divisions, delegitimizing critics as crooked or failing, 
and even refusing, and this is true, in violation of the law to protect young children against the risks associated with lead paint? Well, it's not fascism, but the United States of America has not seen anything like that before. With our system of checks and balances, full-scale authoritarianism is unlikely to happen here, but it would be foolish to ignore the risks that Trump and his administration are posing to establish norms and institutions which help safeguard both order and liberty. These risks will grow if opposition to violations of long-standing norms is limited to Democrats, and if Republicans laugh, applaud, agree with, or make excuses for the president, if they howl with the wolf. In their different ways, Mayer, the American, Hafner, the Romantic German, show how habituation, confusion, distraction, self-interest, fear, rationalization, and a sense of personal powerlessness make terrible things possible. They call attention to the importance of individual actions, both small and large, maybe most important if small, by those of us whose names will never make it into the history books. Nearly two centuries ago, when Concord did its work, James Madison of Virginia warned, is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. Hafner, long after Madison, offered something like a corollary, which is that the ultimate safeguard against aspiring authoritarians and wolves of all kind lies in individual conscience. In quote, decisions taken individually and almost unconsciously by the population of God. Thanks. A young cub reporter interviewed him and said, um, So, Mr. Hemingway, what makes you such a great writer? And Hemingway said, Well, I'm uh, uh, somewhat offended by the question and think he was rather naive, but nonetheless <clears throat> looked at the young man and said, I'm the built in foolproof crap detector. Um, it, you know, smell the rot, smell, smell something that is there that, that shouldn't be there, that doesn't somehow feel right. Um, and you, you turn rightfully to the individual and the individual conscience to do something about the smell of the rot. Um, what, what can, do you believe, individuals like the group gathered here do when we smell that rot and fear that it can spread? It's a great question. Um, vote. Um, work, uh, give money, and uh, speak to one's fellow citizens. So, uh, you know, not many um, blocks from here, there's the place where uh, American soldiers were shot on by the British, and they fired back. And uh, you know, I, I, I say this with a vagueness about one, what, what one is challenging. So 
uh, I want to emphasize that what I hope is clear, which is that the Republican Party has a glorious history. It's the party of Lincoln, and it has glorious presence in terms of people all over the country who are doing great things, who are Republicans. So we will we'll have to isolate the thing that counts, in your view, as fraud. It might be something the Democrats are doing uh, in some place, or in the Senate now. Um, but um, what's amazing is that uh, a, a little voice, if it's exercised, if it's simultaneously exercised by other voices, it can change the world. That's what has happened in our country on so many occasions. And I'll just give one example, which is, you know, I work for President Obama, so it's clear that, uh, I hope it's clear, most of those of us who work for him greatly admire him, and that means we would tend to admire people like him, but Ronald Reagan was a, one of the most important presidents in our history, and he did many great things, and it was because countless people said in one way or another, through a phone call, through a, a vote, through a donation, through a conversation, this guy has something special. Or his opponent, Jimmy Carter, doesn't have something special. You need to change. So th those are things that can be done. And at the local level, you know, through, I'm not in government anymore, but if there's a way that I can do something with private sector that maybe will help one person, or a government in New York or uh, California that can maybe help you know, 200 people, I'm there. And all of us have you know, a, a chance every month to do something. Okay. <laughs> and, and secondly, uh, you've had a chance to travel broadly and abroad. Um, what is your sense of the way in which our country right now is, is viewed in perhaps comparison to what it was like um, even five years ago? Yeah, it's very um, shocking, actually. I do, I do travel internationally a fair bit. And Could you speak up, please? Okay, yeah. yeah. how's that? Better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Could you hear my question? No. Okay, I'm sorry. You guys need to wait if we're not. Okay, I will. I will I'm maybe, sorry. Maybe you don't want to hear us. Maybe it's better because you're right. yeah. <laughs> We'll just sit here and talk among ourselves. <laughs> the, 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 the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire to discuss. Um, so, the, the, my question was he travels, he has his traveled abroad and internationally broadly. Um, what is the perception of the United States right now um, in comparison to perhaps how it looked about five years ago? Uh, one thing I've noticed in multiple countries is that it doesn't matter whether the American president is a Republican or a Democrat, the United States is a beacon of uh, light because of the Statue of Liberty, because of the perceived commitment to freedom and self-government and individual dignity more than anything. I'll tell you a little story a number of years ago I had where um, uh, uh, someone came up to me in Germany and said, is it true that if someone is gay, they can't come into the United States? And something close to that was true. And so I couldn't deny it. And then he said, what about the Statue of Liberty? I said, how can that be, you know, the Statue of Liberty? It was that the United States has an image of being a place where individual dignity is prized. And uh, that was certainly under, true under President Reagan and both President Bush's. Um, now people are dismayed. It's as if the, the beacon is dimmed. And it's, it's not about liking Democrats more than Republicans. Many of them had real issues with President Obama, but they thought he was part of a history of something that was is glorious. And then now the thought is, you know, they, 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 they look at me, this is, this is painful, and they say, you know, your country isn't what we thought it was. And how can the people, is this what the people are like? And they say, no. Um, Secretary Clinton wasn't the best political candidate, and she almost won anyway. And then President Trump had a bunch of ideas that people like that have nothing to do with what you're upset about. Ideas about lowering taxes, and 
about reducing regulation. Ideas which are part of, you know, an honorable part of our political tradition. Many people want a president for those reasons. And then people look at me as if I'm speaking some language they've never heard. They think something's gone terribly wrong with, with the country. And there, there is a sense in which, I've noticed also, that it's not quite right to say China is filling the gap. It is true that China is massively, uh, its importance is massively increasing. But the United States occupies a distinctive role, and as it recedes, as if there, it's as if there's no one who's filling the gap. It's as if there's a little chaos there. And uh, this is completely fixable. So if, you know, if the Trump administration shifts in some important ways, or if there's a Republican or Democrat in 2020, or if the House of Representatives goes Democratic uh, in, this, in the coming election, that will be a signal of some kind. But th there's no question that people all over the world, conservative, liberal, doesn't matter, they are, uh, they're sad. Uh, Mark, Okay, we will take questions from the floor, and I, there's been one right over here first. Actually, yes. Can we back for just a moment? I'm going to do green this before. Oh, all right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Type of one. The woman in the purple. Purple. Button. The woman in the purple. No, or, or to your left. Okay, it's not purple. It's black. Yeah, black. Black. Yeah. This way. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Really Hi. Um, a couple of things. A uh, couple of things. We talk about what can we do. Friday morning at some like nine something a.m., Jeff Flake was on his way to vote yes to put what's his name out of the committee and into it. I can't. I, I, I don't have the vocabulary. I'm sorry. I'm nervous. So, but while while he was going into the elevator to go to that boat, two women held up that door and changed the course of history, at least for a week. And that's one thing, I mean, you, you can do is just get involved and put yourself on the line like that. Another thing is I put in my calendar, January 19, the Women's March, not only in the U.S., but around the world, the third Women's March. And that Women's March with the Me Too movement has, has sort of softened the ground for letting those two women be so effective in what they did on Friday morning. Secondly, I've just come across that the Atlantic has a new issue in October. You're just talking about it. And um, I just found, excuse me a minute, found one article by a woman named Ann Applebaum. And it's called, uh, A Warning from Europe, The Worst is Yet to Come. She talks on the very personal, what she's witnessed in her country, Poland, how it's gone from being more democratic to being more totalitarianism. And then she broadens it way out to the whole world and deep into history, way back to like classical Greece. And I'm getting the impression that what's happening is like this pendulum that happens all the time between wanting to have the freedoms and care for each other and, and, and really heal the hurts and going to the other side where wanting to control everything power-wise. Thank you. Could you thank talk you. about that? Let's keep our questions okay. short, so, okay, because many people will have them, but thank you for starting us off so thoughtfully. Let me, I'll, I'll try to be short in an answer. That's a great question. But uh, one of my heroes, uh, social scientist uh, uh, in psychology, said he's an optimist. And the reason to be an optimist is if you're a pessimist, you suffer twice. Once, once when you think about the bad thing and once when it happens. 
And so it's rational not to be a pessimist on that ground. But on you know, the particular question you ask about whether the world is going on an anti-democratic pendulum and the worst is yet to come, I don't believe it for a minute. And the reason I don't believe it for a minute isn't only because I'm an optimist by nature. There's a very recent careful study of the circumstances under which nations go authoritarian having been democratic. And basically, if they are not poor, and if they are, um, uh, if they have a tradition of democracy, uh, the probability that they go un into an authoritarian uh, spiral is really, really small. So this is based on a lot of statistical analysis of a lot of countries over a lot of time. And basically, the probability that the United States goes authoritarian, by his account, it's. Uh, I think it's higher than the probability that one of us is going to be struck by lightning tonight, but it's not a lot higher. It's really low. What's his name again? Uh, his name is, it's, uh, his last name is uh, T-R-E-I-C-H-M-A-N, uh, Daniel uh, Trishman, and he's at Dartmouth. Uh, I'm 99% sure I have the, the right name. Yes, um, sir. Back over here. T-R-E-I-S-M-A-N. Thank you so much for that. That's helping a little bit. Um, and I have to say that I think you're exactly right about all of us doing something. For me, that's felt like it's an absolutely necessary to just do something here or there, it's a way to stay sane. Um, but I have not been taking the whole question of impeachment seriously for a long time, but I just changed my mind a couple of months ago, and it feels to me now like we've got six, seven, eight grounds which are really well detailed and supported by the factual record in the past, uh, and he's over the line on these things, and. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about, about that. So, uh, I wrote a book in 2017 called Impeachment, uh, Citizen Guide, and it does not mention any current politician. And it was inspired by April 19, 1775, and not by anything in the 20th century. So, uh, uh, the reason, there are many reasons why I didn't mention any current politician. One is that I think if we focus on uh, that, we can lose sight of the standards that our Constitution has. Um, the, the question is whether we can identify a uh, egregious misuse of presidential authority. That's the basic standard. It needn't be a crime. Um, and, and that's, you know, the Constitution gives us that right. Part of what Benjamin Franklin said, uh, was asked, what have you given us? After the constitutional drafters walked down the steps in Philadelphia, they had a constitution, and uh, Ms. Mrs. Powell said to Benjamin Franklin, then 81 years old, said, what have you given us? And he answered, uh, a republic if you could keep it. And that was a reference to many aspects of the Constitution, but one central one is impeachment, and that doesn't matter if the president is called Obama or Clinton or Bush or Trump. It's 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 there. It's a it's a resort. Yes. Well, one of the comments that you made is that we should speak to our neighbors. But one of the problems uh, that we have today is we self-assort ourselves in groups of people who have like thinking. With that in mind, do you have any recommendations? This another thing is the difference between the rise of Nazism and the present day is a little confusing to me in regard to the fact that when Nazism rose, they were rising at a very deep depression. Right now, um, when Trump was elected, he was elected in a time period when the economy was resolved, and admittedly some people still did not have the jobs they had, but it seems to be a somewhat different uh, scenario. 
Okay, those are great points. So um, maybe it's fair to say that democratic norms are under more pressure than we've seen in a long time in our country, which is a much more modest thing to say than that authoritarianism is a serious threat. So I agree that democratic norms are under severe pressure. The fact that Facebook and Google, I think, are being investigated at the president's order by the Department of Justice because, I think, of the president's unfounded belief that Google is making political judgments about search engines, and then the Department of Justice is, dude, that's, that's an attack on democratic norms. Presidents don't do that kind of thing. So that's not good, but it's nothing like full-scale authoritarianism. So in other words, I agree with the thrust of your second point, which is that we have a problem, and some real people are suffering very seriously because of the problem. Kids are being separated from parents. Uh, people who are here are being deported in a way that's heartbreaking. Um, there are threats of multiple kinds, but it isn't like what's happening in Turkey or the Philippines. And the fact that our economy is strong, that's beautiful in about a thousand and one different ways. One is it means that people are not suffering serious economic uh, distress as much as they otherwise would. The other thing is that it does relieve the pressure to be to call for radical solutions. And I love your point about people self-sorting. So if any of us is not talking to people of a different political party, or is not uh, getting a sympathetic appreciation of why many of our fellow citizens either think President Trump is great or think he's on balance good, though they don't like some of the things he's doing. If we haven't heard from them or read what they think, that's not ideal. So I've uh, learned a great deal just from some conversation not long ago with a Vietnam vet who said he's strongly for President Trump. And the reason is he thinks that President Trump at least talks as if he's gonna help veterans. And he says, I don't know about the Democrats, but they don't even talk about it. At least President Trump talks about it. And this, this is a wonderful person. There's no hatred in him. He's just, he has Agent Orange, he's suffering serious disease, so does his daughter, and he wants some help. And he thinks this guy may be. And that, that was an instructive conversation. So to know what people are thinking. I work, worked in Washington and I know the, the kind of uh, business people pretty well. I oversaw regulation of President Obama and I had a lot of meetings with business people who want less regulation. And they like President Trump. They think that he's reducing the pressure on the manufacturing sector, on the coal industry in general. And if you got them behind closed doors, I think they'd say there's a lot of stuff they don't like. But it's a deal they'll take if their companies can grow. And for Democrats to speak to that concern, as well as the concern of my almost friend, my friendly acquaintance, who has Agent Orange, that's very important. And for Republicans who don't love everything about President Trump, I heard, by the way, something very interesting from a member of Congress, a Democrat, who said, well, you have to know about the Republicans in Congress. You have to know two things. First, they really don't like President Trump at all. And second, they're terrified of him. And so the, the fact that they are publicly quiet or supportive, he said they fear that one tweet from him and they lose their jobs. That that's not a profile in courage, but it's instructive. First of all, thanks for your um, uh, your eloquence and your the breadth of your service and the, uh, the literature you brought into this conversation. Um, one of the things I noted in, in Diane's preamble of her experience is it, it seems to me that you have a lot of practical experience, um, which sometimes I feel like we're a little frustrated. We need more of it. Um, and one of the things you mentioned in the two authors that you um, remarked upon was 
their direct one-on-one -on -one contact and observations. And I'm thinking about voices because we talked about, for instance, you know, what can Concord do? What can what can we do in a self-selected space other than leave and go and talk to other people that we wouldn't run into on a daily basis? Um, but I also think that there are some voices that aren't regularly heard from, that aren't quoted except in, um, uh, you know, in sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one or, or in special circumstances. And those are the youth and now women. And women are clearly getting a, a platform, um, but as, as I can only speak for myself, a lot of it is very emotionally ranged. It's, it's, it's a moment of outlet. There isn't a, a, a as clear a set of practical points of address other than one individual or a series of individual or a series of, of uh, highly targeted decisions. So, and I would say that for the youth in this room, of which I'm excited to see quite a few, um, those who have the vote already, what can they do um, other than you know, go and vote. That, that's great, but I want, I want to make sure power is the collective sense of ability to change because one of your authors was a youth observing things changing. And I've seen more clarity from my children about the rock. And it's not individuals as much as it's climate change rock, as it's uh, gender and racism rock as it's uh, economic, um, the has not not rock. That's great, so I'm thinking of two models. So when I was a professor at the University of Chicago, there was a law professor, there were two people who were Boston's, they were great, they were very conservative, and they thought there aren't many um, conservative outlets, and the judges and the lawyers, they're all left of center, or at least the powerful ones are. So they created something called the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society. <laughs> They're really important. And these are just two students who thought we needed that organization. And they basically have been picking judges for many presidents, uh, or at least playing a role in the picking of judges. And they are steering the conversation. They created an organization. Um, uh, William F. Buckley Jr., also in his 20s, uh, some of you won't remember that name, but he wrote a book, a book called God and Man at Yale, which said two things. One is that uh, Yale is against religion, and the other is Yale is against freedom and free enterprise, free markets. And the book said that you know, elite educational institutions are uh, atheist and agnostic, and they are collectivist. And uh, it was an immensely influential book, partly because it spurred organizations. So what I'm thinking with the Federal Society and uh, the Buckley movement, the movement, and he created something called uh, uh, Young Americans for Freedom, something like that, which was started small. So to create an organization of some kind, it could be something like, you know, the Society for Future Generations, if climate change is your focus. Or it could be uh, the end of the domestic violence or the end of sexual violence, and it could have an acronym. And the second issue in particular is, um, is not partisan. Uh, the climate change issue, guess whether a majority of Republicans believe climate, man-made climate change is real? Yes, they do. So it's not as partisan as you think from the, the news. So to create an organization and a network, uh, I've been surprised to learn in some of the work I've been doing over the last months to see. I'll tell you, can I tell you something really small and quite personal? So I'm interested in, uh, in how human beings depart from standard economic theories of behavior. So we are not as rational as standard economic theory suggests. Sometimes we are too optimistic. Sometimes we focus on today and tomorrow, and not next year. And so we created a little organization at Harvard called the Behavioral Health Insights Program. And 
and I was talking to some doctors at the medical school about it, and as soon as we created a program, uh, if you build it, they will come, as in the movie. So we started getting letters from doctors all over the country. You have a program. And it, it looks like we have one initiative that's, with a little luck, it's going to prevent uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 deaths in 2018. One initiative. And it's because we created a program. So create a something. That, that's an idea. And see if it grows. And even if it stays relatively small, it's something. So the National Rifle Association, the NRA, uh, is massively important. I saw in Washington, I was confirmed by the Senate. That's a story. That was not a lot of fun. And there was a moment when the National Rifle Association was exercised about me, and the question was whether they would come out in a very public way against me, and in which case I would have been in big trouble. And it, they came out against me, but not in that big way. And so it worked out narrowly. But it was the immense power of an organization. And the National Rifle Organization the, the, the started small. Well, you know, that, that, that reminds us in, contra, in contradistinction to those young kids in Florida who have organized um, and, and stepped up and spoken against guns in schools and asked that there not be guns in schools. Um, and, and the power of that small group of students has been impressive, I think, um, and, and much to be admired. Next question. We can take about uh, two or three more questions. A young man back there um, in a, kind of a red shirt and a... Yes. You mentioned that it was more. You mentioned that it was difficult to maintain stability and with divisive political figures. How do we maintain stability in this day and age when we have disagreements on facts and a, such a politically alienating president? It's a great question. I don't think I said it's difficult to maintain stability, but I'm glad you did. So. <laughs> That's your, that's your point. That's a great Washington trick, by the way, to attribute an idea to someone else because they always enjoy it. I think maybe it was their idea. Uh, it, it, you're completely right. And so uh, I'll tell you what my heart thinks, and then it's a little, my head's a little more complicated. My heart thinks that civility is not the highest virtue, but pretty close. And, you know, uh, whoever your least favorite politician is, um, or someone who thinks he's doing something bad, uh, the likelihood that they are good and decent in a thousand and one different ways is really high. So Senator, uh, then Senator Biden, Vice President Biden, had a story about some member of Congress who he was uh, extremely enraged with, who had done something uh, I think on health care or on children that he thought was completely uh, unthinkably awful and he was about to attack him personally and he went into one of the older members of the Senate and said, that guy is a horror show and I'm going to tell the world about that. And then uh, the older senator showed him a story about the senator who he was about to call out and the story was about how he had adopted a large number of orphans uh, and was raising them with great difficulty with his wife just for humanitarian reasons. And he was giving a large chunk of his life to helping children who had no other place to go. And he said, attack their views, but never their motives. And, and that's, that's the civility point. My head thinks that uh, civility is a really high virtue, but sometimes tough talk is justified. So when, um, during the McCarthy hearings, uh, Senator McCarthy was asked, have you no shame? Yeah. Well, that's kind of a good one. Maybe that doesn't stretch the bounds of civility, because have you no shame is appealing to someone's common humanity. And something like that is probably the way to stretch the bounds of civility, rather than to tell people, you know. Because in their own head, the people who you think least well loved they probably have a plausible account of why they're doing what they're doing. And it, it, it doesn't just look ugly or evil, it looks, from their point of view, reasonable. 
Yes, sir, and the blue Thank you. Um, the, the authoritarian uh, societies of the 1920s and 30s largely grew out of the nationalist socialist movements in both it, in Italy, uh, Russia, and in Germany. And I was wondering how you see the contemporary authoritarian movements, perhaps in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere. Um, how do they differ, or do they? That's uh, a question on which I, I don't have enough expertise. I, I do have uh, relative clarity that uh, socialism, 1930s style or Soviet style, is a uh, sibling to fascism or a cousin. And so uh, anything that smacks of communism or socialism very good, in my view, to be extremely wary of. Um, my understanding is that what's happened in Poland and Hungary as a kind of nationalist fervor whose relationship to socialism is very unclear, and uh, the links between what happened in the 30s and socialism, I agree with you, they are tighter. What I don't know about Germany is whether the word socialist was just by an accident of language in the fascists, uh, something they adopted, or whether, or whether it actually had something com in common with leftist socialism. It did in the sense that it's, you know, control, a lot of government control of stuff. But a, a different, you know, the Soviet stuff was the, had a Marxist overlayer, underlayer, everything. And the fascism of the 30s had, had no Marxism in it. That's different. Certainly the authoritarianism we're observing now, Marx is in playing a role. Uh, I would want a pox on the Marxist house and on the fascist house, but they, you know, they're, they're cousins, I think. Different houses. All right, yes, sir. Over here. <clears throat> Even with the Constitution and Benjamin Franklin answered that, uh, I think it was September 17, 1787, I became a U.S. citizen four days after the bicentennial of that day as a pacifist and conscientious objector. And I arrived in this country just before Reagan was elected president. If we take um, one of the most prominent psychoanalysts of the 20th century, Eric Fromm, writing the book To Have or To Be, and saying that if we continue living with so many lies, we will end up in technocratic fascism. That's basically what it is since Reagan. And if we take Chomsky saying that all US presidents after the Second World War were tried under the Nuremberg laws, they should be all hanged as war criminals. Obama, for example, bombed more than W. So I, I'm trying to say that 
you're bringing Germany in that time, but that's a European population with still long time revolutionary experience, including Marx and uh, workers' movement and all that. There has been here also a lot of struggle, workers, anarchists, and it continues, but to compare the two populations. From my experience, and I've been all over the world, this population as a mass of the US is probably the most uninformed about the world and the most naively believing the government and propaganda than ever any of the peoples of the Soviet bloc were. And I come from there. Yeah. Yeah. Experience both systems. Okay, the, so the question you. is, is it really now any democracy left at all? Or it's only like always been in a theory and like what for now West call it plutocracy or um, yeah. Okay, so there's, there's, we have a lot, so I know, thank you. Yeah, I understood it. So the, the question was basically, is, is the United States has never been a republic? And there were references to um, actions by U.S. presidents that in the questioner's view were war crimes or you know, terrible bombing. And so Slavery, all the genocides. No. So let, 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 let me make a little patriotic statement, if I may. So. Uh, um, something happened that basically here, I mean literally here, um, people are walking out. They don't, they like your question, they, they weren't liking like my answer. Thank you for coming. Something happened in the 1730s, 70s, 40s, 70s, 50s, which was uh, an insistence on the equal dignity of human beings. And uh, that insistence on the equal human be dignity of human beings uh, devastated the monarchical legacy. It made the idea of a king uh, intolerable. It made people like Thomas Paine say, we see through other eyes, we hear through other ears, we smell through different noses. Nothing like that ever happened before. Uh, that what happened was the idea of the subject was repudiated in favor of the idea of the citizen. The civil rights movement of the 1960s owes its direct lineage to actions that occurred and thoughts that were rethought in Concord in the 1740s and 1750s. The rise of the women's movement is a reflection of a commitment to the equal dignity of human beings which came out of a tradition that was fueled by the 1740s and 50s. The right to same-sex marriage partakes of ideas about dignity that came out of that era, so too with freedom of speech. And to Cornel West and Noam Chomsky can speak all they want about plutocracy. And uh, Vladimir Putin is not a fan of freedom of speech. He is not a fan of same-sex marriage. Uh, principles of democratic equality, which you get to enjoy because you're a citizen of the United States, that's a blessing. I uh, am in a place where I will say right now, I thank God that I get to enjoy those blessings, and uh, every American does. Sir, last, last question. Mr. Back over here. He just had his hand up a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry I came in late, but I've enjoyed what I've heard very much. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that one shouldn't attack one person, the personality, but the ideas behind it. What, in your assessment, is a unifying idea behind Mr. Trump? Has he got one? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I work for President Obama. The question, the question is, what's a unifying idea for President Trump? And 
say I, I worked for President Obama, and I just believe it's uh, it's gracious for a uh, Obama uh, employee to be careful and quiet before condemning his successor. That's just my own view. Um, I know the person who was chosen by President Trump to run the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. She's terrific, and she's working every day to try to make automobile safety better in the United States. And there are, um, you know, 36,000 Americans died in 2016, and she's trying to reduce that number. Uh, I know someone who's working in the Department of Treasury who's committed to ideals about equality of opportunity, and he wants the Treasury Department to fuel those ideals. Uh, the Trump administration has recently reaffirmed many of the environmental and health and safety regulations of the Obama administration, regulations that involve air pollution and um, uh, highway safety. Reaffirm them, and those are great things. No, if there's doubt, no, you want the names? Nitrogen oxide, uh, uh, ozone, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and lead. And those are the mainstays of federal environmental, yes, they are. I mean, this is my job, so I know this. They've all been reaffirmed. Some of them explicitly, as in the ozone case, where the EPA said we're not going to alter it. Some of them implicitly, as in the lead case, where there's just no effort to change that. In the context of uh, occupational exposure to silica, which is a killer of construction workers, the Trump administration hasn't touched the regulation done under President Obama. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's something to be pleased by. Say again? Coal ash regulations, that science advisory panel, got it? No, no, I, I didn't okay. say everything. Okay. I mean, fuel efficiency standards? Yes, I mean, no, those are not. Okay. No, so on the fuel efficiency, so two propositions that don't contradict each other can both be true. So the, so <laughs> what you've said is correct on the coal ash I haven't studied, but uh, the important one that I have studied is fuel economy, and you're completely right. Well, you're half right. It hasn't been guided. There's a proposal to guide it. The proposals are good. I hope the proposal will not be finalized. So the, the main air pollution regulations have been affirmed, and the fuel economy one has been proposed to change. That's most unfortunate in my view. I completely agree with you. And the climate change regulations, some significant ones, they've proposed to change, and I think that's a mistake. But I'll give you a number, shall I? The Bush administration finalized 2,500 regulations, many involving civil rights, health and safety. The Obama administration finalized 2,100, many of them involving health and safety and poverty and uh, food safety. And that's 30, 2,500 plus 2,100, that's 4,600. The Trump administration has finally lim eliminated, guess how many of those 4,600? Dozens. Dozens. That's not a lot. That is rich. Yes, I agree with you. So the, the, I'm not saying that the Trump administration's, that I'm excited about the Trump administration's decisions. And as, as I say, I've registered as either Republican or Democrat. I'm very pleased about that. As, uh, I think there's good in both parties. But the Trump administration has specifically affirmed the ozone regulation. There's a regulation that is designed to protect small children that says cars that are back over, or have to have cameras in them, so you know fewer back over crashes. If you buy a new car, it's gonna have a back over, protection against back over crashes. That's gonna save children. The, it's an Obama administration regulation. I don't think that that rule exists, by the way, in Russia that cars have to be equipped with back over cameras, and that's to protect little kids, and the Trump administration said, yes, we, we agree with that. We're gonna put it in place in 2018. So, you know, I, I, I'd like this, our focus to be on self-government and how we maintain it, rather than on what we think of a particular president, but the question was, what can we take that we have common, you know, across partisan line support for, and these are, 4,600 regulations, they've eliminated dozens, 
and you're right, some of them are, I think, very not good that they propose to eliminate, including climate change ones. It's my view, but 4,600 men minus dozens, you got a big number. Well, I, 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 Concordians, uh, we will watch every one of those accretions wherever they happen. Uh, and even if there are only dozens, we will lament them and follow them and pursue them and haunt them to get them back under regulatory control because that's what Concordians do and do well. Um, thank you so very much. And thank you all for coming. It means a great deal to us to believe. And of course, the most important thing we can do, as we all know, is to vote.